What I'd like to do is to talk about 12 lead EKG, and I want to set up just a foundational knowledge of EKG. And actually, this is going to be a series of videos where I break it down into things like the conduction cycle, Itobis triangle. One of the first things I want to do is give an index of those smaller videos, but before I even get to that, I want to set a context here. And that context is I want to be very clear that I'm no MD. I have a PhD in neuroscience, and I have never interpreted an EKG that actually mattered towards somebody's health. What I do have is a background in electrophysiology, and that drives me to understand EKG on a theoretical level. I also teach community college to pre-nursing students, pre-HIT, pre-rad tech, basically pre-professionals in the health industry. And I think that because these students are going to be seeing 12 lead EKGs more and more, it would be nice if they had a foundational knowledge. It would also be really, really nice that if I'm, if I'm ever in the hospital bed, that that nurse has a basic understanding of what a long QT is, what a broad QRS is, what a QRS axis is and make sure that it's not no man's land so I'm not going to die. So I guess I have some selfish motivations here. One of the things that I've done is I've looked considerably at EKG and EKG tutorials and it seems to me like most of those videos or websites or things, they're going to tell you what the leads are and they're going to jump right into a patient's health or a diagnosis. And that seems to leave an intervening step for me. Maybe that's because of my background in biophysics. I want to actually understand how the electrical signal is picked up by the EKG and how that electrical signal is changed by changes in the heart. So that's why I'm putting this video out here. Is I'm hoping that it's a unique perspective that shows people the foundations of 12 lead EKG. Most of the content that I've gotten is from a book called Bioelectric Magnetism and this book is freely available available on the web. It's at http www.bem.fi. I assume that that means bioelectromagnetism in Finland. So www.bem.fi backward slash book backward slash index.htm and you can read the book yourself. I'm also using some of their figures so I'd like to give them attribution for that right now. Some of the caveats, two additional caveats, and then we'll get started, is because I want to create a complete foundation, there might be a couple of steps here that you haven't heard of in a normal, if you've gone through a normal um, a normal education on EKG. Like, we have to talk about something called septal depolarization if we want to understand the Q wave. Also, because my students are not medical students, they're pre-professional health students, I might do some simplifications, and I'm going to point these out as I go along. So let's start with the introduction. What do I want to do? The first thing I want to talk about is I want to create a video that says, what are the disorders that can be diagnosed and maybe we'll just get that out of the way now we'll talk about those you can determine electrical axis so is the voltage traveling through the heart in the correct direction and that's important because electricity is going to precede muscle contraction and you need the muscle to contract in the right direction so that you can fill your ventricles and then push blood out of the ventricles into the systemic circuit. So that's important. You need a correct sequence. You need a correct electrical axis. You can diagnose hypertrophy, which is thickening of, wall, of the heart wall. Arrhythmia is when the heart is beating erratically. You can diagnose too fast, too slow, which would be tachycardia and bradycardia. Any kind of abnormal sequence. We'll get to the conduction cycle here, and any abnormality in the conduction cycle can be picked up with the EKG. Drug effects like digitalis can be picked up, but potassium imbalances, sodium imbalances, calcium imbalances will all be detectable on the ECG. ECG. Carditis or inflammation, disorders in coronary circulation, when there's not enough blood flow, that will also show up on the ECG. So those are the disorders that can be diagnosed. One of the first things that we have to do, though, is we have to introduce the conduction cycle. And that is how electricity travels through the heart. We're going to put that down here in the middle just because that one's really, really important. We'll talk about Eindhoven's triangle. Eindhoven was the first guy that put his foot in a bucket of salt water and measured these electrical currents through the heart. We're then going to look at how the leads in Eindhoven's triangle detect changes in voltage created by the conduction cycle. So this is going to be kind of a cyclical movie, and that's why I'm drawing things in a circle. Then we're going to put it all together for the simple leads, and that would be leads 1, 2, and 3. 
We'll then go into the augmented leads. We'll stop at that point and do the QRS axis. Then go into the precordial leads. Or it's sometimes easier called the chest leads. And then I'm going to send you out to something called ECG Library. Or you can go out to various tutorial sites. If you just Google ECG training or EKG training, you'll find plenty of tutorials. Putting it all together with ECG Library. The reason I like ECG Library is he asks you to go, whoever the author is, I'm sorry, I'll, uh, I'll find the website. It's www.ecglibrary.com. He asks you to diagnose a normal EKG. And to diagnose a normal EKG, you basically have to go through and exclude any abnormalities. And he can link to different disorders and show you what the EKG would look like if a person have a, has a arrhythmia or a bundle branch block. How many of you saw this comment that we've got a cycle Disorders that can be diagnosed, we've got to do conduction cycle, then we'll do Eindhoven's triangle, then we'll do how the leads detect changes, we'll put it all together, do augmented leads, QRS axis, pre cordials and we'll come back to disorders that can be diagnosed. So we're doing EKG. ECG. And there's another video that basically introduces the steps we're going to go through. What the steps we're going to do to, uh, uh, in this video are going to be conduction cycle, talk about Eindhoven's triangle, talk about how leads. pick up voltage changes in the conduction cycle and we'll talk about basics of leads one two and three well, the first thing we need to do is go through the conduction cycle and depending on how you've learned this before or if you have learned this before, the steps might be a little bit different, but the reason they're going to be a little bit different now is because you need to have all these steps included in order to understand every deflection in the EKG. So exam for example, most people don't include septal depolarization in just kind of a generic lead to description. But we're going to need septal depolarization because it's necessary to explain the Q wave. One of the first things that we're going to cover, and I'm going to color code everything, is depolarization of atria. Now, if I can sneak this over here, what the EKG is doing is picking up voltage changes. And this is the action potential of muscle its voltage over time. So we're going to pick up this voltage change right here. And that's going to show up as depolarization of the I'm going to switch to uh, colored pencils, and you'll see why in a second. Because it all starts here. I don't know if that's visible much at all. I'll try and make it a little bit visible. But as you'll see later, what an EKG actually picks up is sums, and so I want to leave this light so that I can actually deal with the sum voltages. So this is depolarization of the atria. That's when a voltage change occurs across the atria. Next up is repolarization of the atria. Again, if we're picking up voltage changes, then we're going to pick up this voltage change as well, and it's going to be called repolarization, and we'll pick it up over here. Again, I'm going to switch to a colored pencil. So basically, it shows up 
or it would progress through the heart, reversing the path of depolarization. The next step is there's going to be a little pause in the AV node, and the reason for that pause is it allows the atria to contract completely to fill the ventricles before the ventricles contract. So we'll just kind of put that as a pause. We won't actually put it in our list. Next step, and this is one that you might not have heard before. Again, it's really critical if you want to understand everything in the EKG. This is important for understanding the Q wave, and this is called septal depolarization. I haven't drawn my structure real well, but there's a what's called a left bundle branch block. Sorry, left bundle branch and a right bundle branch. And we're going to depolarize the septum. Next up is something called apical depolarization. Switch back to my colored pencils. And this is when we're depolarizing the apex. And remember that the left side of the heart is much, much thicker. The wall is thicker than the right. And so most of the voltage is going to go up the left. And so that's why I've drawn more arrows here. The next step is called late left ventricular. depolarization. And this, at this point, most of the voltage has gone as far up as the right atrium, sorry, the right ventricle as it's going to go. And now we're going to follow the current the rest of the way up the left. And our last step is repolarization. And you might be noticing something different here, that when we talked about the atria, we depolarize and repolarize right away. It doesn't work that way in the ventricles. In the ventricles, you depolarize all of the muscle and then repolarize at the end. And then you reverse the path completely. And these lines will show up in a second a little bit better if you're not seeing them. Okay, so that's the conduction cycle. Let's draw an Eintowen's triangle, which is really kind of not that big of a deal. Unless you're Mr. Eintowen. But Eintowen's triangle basically describes the way the leads are placed. And the leads are going to pick up these voltage changes. It'll become critical in a second to understand the orientation and why I'm putting these arrows on here, but it's not real important at this point. Suffice it to say that they're leads. They're called lead 1, lead 2. And lead 2 is important because that's the typical one that you're going to see if you're looking at just a single trace on an EKG. And lead 3. Okay, so now we have this conduction cycle, which really just describes voltage changes in the heart. We got Eindhoven's triangle, which describes the leads that will pick up those voltage changes. The next thing is how do those leads pick up those voltage changes? And there's some basic rules. Rules of the leads, let's just call it that. One leads some voltages. What I mean is, and I'm going to stay with my pencil, is technically this voltage is going in multiple directions across the heart. But the EKG doesn't pick up multiple directions. It picks up one sum. It sees one arrow. I'm making this a little bit smaller. But it picks up one arrow. And that one arrow represents depolarization of atrium. Similarly, similarly, it sums 
three polarization into one arrow. It sums septal depolarization into one arrow. Let's put it up here. It's going to be a small arrow because really you're only depolarizing the septa, the septum, which is not very big. And it's going to be dominated by this voltage spreading across the papillary muscles that are going to hold the tricuspid valve closed during contraction. So it's a very small arrow. Let's face it in that direction. Next up is apical. An apical will be summed as a large arrow. It's going to be pointed towards the apex because even though some current is going in this direction on the right, most of it's going on the left. So our overall sum is going to look like this. Late left is going to look a little bit confusing. And I'm just going to fill this in like this. We're going to go up the left. I'm actually going to turn the corner a little bit. Repolarization. Again, does not occur until after depolarization is complete. So it's going to be a rather long path, and it's going to be rather circuitous. All right, so that's lead sum voltages. Rule two. is leads only pick up voltage changes parallel to the lead. It's a little bit more specific. Leads only pick up that part of the voltage change that is parallel. It's kind of like if I asked you to tell me how long this pen is, as long as the pen is parallel to the plane of your eyes, you can tell that this pen is about four and a half inches long. But if I turn it this way and I ask you to tell me how long this pen is, you can't tell. It's kind of the same thing with the lead. If we're at lead three, and we're looking at this voltage change, this voltage change is heading in this direction, it would be as if we were trying to figure out how long this pen is by looking at it this direction. If it's a little bit offset, then you're forced to say this pen is about two inches long, or if I change it all the way, you say the pen is about four inches. So basically the lead will only pick up that part of the voltage change that runs parallel to it. So if you only can see a little bit parallel, then you'll see, then the EKG will sense a very small change in voltage. If it's running very parallel, it'll recognize a large voltage change. If it's completely perpendicular, it won't recognize the voltage change hardly at all. The third thing is, as I added these arrows, and these arrows actually represent a plus sign. So there's a polarity to these voltage changes. And what it means is if a voltage change is in the same direction of the lead, it will cause the trace to go up. It'll go up on EKG paper, so we would go up. If the voltage change is in the opposite direction, of the lead, it will go down on the trace. That's how you get upward deflections and downward deflections. So if the voltage change is with the lead, for example, this depolarization is pointed in the same direction as this lead. So this would go up on the EKG trace. 
this arrow is pointing in the opposite direction of our lead, so this would cause the trace to go down on our EKG paper or screen. Kind of a simple way to show that might be just to draw some hearts. Fit one more in. And if, let's say that we're looking from lead two, so looking from this angle, lead two, if the current was going in this direction, it would cause a huge upward deflection on the EKG. If it was in this direction, well, it wouldn't be quite as parallel, and so it would still cause an upward, but not as large. If the voltage change was perpendicular to this lead, it would cause what's called an isoelectric change. Now my voltage change is going in the opposite direction of my lead, so this would cause it to go down. And if the voltage change was directly opposite of our lead, it would cause a large negative deflection. Okay, so the last piece of this puzzle then is to put those first three steps together into what the trace is actually going to look like. And to do that, I'm actually going to start spinning the paper because it's actually helpful to kind of pretend that you're the lead. So, the first step in our conduction cycle is right here. And this is running with, we're going to do lead 2 because lead 2 is the main lead you're going to see. What's running pretty parallel to our lead, and it's running in the direction of our lead. So we're going to see a pretty big upward deflection. Now, I'm kind of oversimplifying a little bit because it's probably because most of the time this is presented, it's presented in depolarization and repolarization. Most of the time this is presented, it's going to be a little bit of an oversimplification because most of the time that it's presented, repolarization is actually placed within what's going on in the rest of the heart, so you don't see it. And that may be true. There may be some kind of circuitous cycle that causes this, but I think it makes more sense to draw to describe this the way that I am, which is let's just go ahead and get repolarization right in the P wave. And so now my arrow is going in the opposite direction. It's going against my lead, and so it's going to go down. Let's just keep spinning, and let's just do the P wave so you can see what I'm doing. Let's go up to lead, lead 1. Now lead 1, I'm not quite as parallel as I was over in lead 2. It's still running with my lead, and so it's going to cause an upward deflection. But if you'll note, it's a lower or smaller upward deflection than it was over here. And again, the reason is because this is much more parallel to lead 2 than it is to lead 1. So it looks much bigger to lead 2 than it does to lead 1. Same thing with repolarization. We spin all the way to 3, you don't need to make you dizzy. Well, now you can see, if we follow our rules, that this is going to look, this is going, is almost running perfectly perpendicular. So it's going to look very small. Okay, so that's the P wave, and how we're picking up these two arrows here. Let's come back to lead 2, and now is when it gets a little difficult, because... We have to add in this delay, and I'm just going to go ahead and add it into all of these right now. There's a delay as you wait in the AV node, and we put that as a pause up here. But let's capture this septal depolarization in the EKG now. And it's kind of very perpendicular, and it's kind of running against our lead, so it's going to be a very small downward deflection. Let's just go ahead and follow this trace all the way through. Very small downward deflection. We got this green, which is apical depolarization. It's going to be a big current with my lead. So it's running in the same direction as my lead. So it's going to cause a big upward. I'm next going to pick up late left. And late left runs against my lead. So it's running, my lead is going this way. This current is going this direction. So I'm going to go negative. This last part is perpendicular. And so you might see a little bit of an upward, or you might see just a flat effect. There's going to be a pause between depolarization and repolarization. There's a pause 
between depolarization and repolarization, and that's reflected on the EKG by some baseline. We got one last wave, and that's the repolarization. It starts running perpendicular to our lead, so we don't see it. It starts to run with our lead. It's going this way. Our lead goes this way, so we're going to go up. You notice it turns a corner, though, and starts heading in the opposite direction of our lead, so we actually head back down. So that's a typical lead to PQRS trace. And what I mean by PQRS is this is called the P wave, this is called the Q wave, this is called the R wave, this is called the S wave, and this is called the T wave. That's typically what you see if you see just a basic trace. And hopefully it's what you see if you look over at your own EKG monitor. Let's jump up to lead one and do the same kind of thing. Now our arrows are obviously going to be a little bit different. We're, we put in our pause already. Let's do septal depolarization. Septal depolarization now is more parallel to this lead. It's running in the opposite direction of the lead, so it's going to be a bigger negative. Apical depolarization runs with our lead. It's not going to be as big as over here. It's running with our lead. For a good portion of late left ventricular, we're going to be per perpendicular. But there's going to be a portion that runs against our lead. So we're going to come back down. Again, we're going to have that pause. I don't know if you can remember this from upside down, but we're going to have that pause between depolarization and repolarization. And then we've got to pick up the repolarization. That's going to run with our lead for a time. It's going to run per perpendicular to our lead, so we won't catch it. And it's going to run against our lead. So that's our trace. Again, just to reiterate, we got P, Q, R, S, and T. Now lead 3 is a little bit different because we're going to start right here. Oh, I guess we're going to do septal depolarization. We're going to start with septal depolarization, and it runs a little bit with our lead, so it's going to go up a little bit. Now, apical depolarization also runs with our lead. Late left is curious because it runs against our lead. But it turns a corner and it runs back with our lead. So it's kind of a funny shape. Can we pause for the step between depolarization and repolarization? And the T wave in lead 3 often looks inverted. And the reason that is, is because we start running opposite of our lead, which takes it down runs perpendicular, sorry, it runs with our lead, and then it kind of runs perpendicular. And so often, T wave is inverted in lead 3. Okay, next up we're doing QRS axis. So we're doing EKG. We've gone through several several steps at this point. We've talked about disorders that can be diagnosed with conduction cycle, Antoine's triangle, what are the leads? How do they pick up the voltage changes? And if you have not watched those other videos, you might want to watch those because we're jumping ahead right now to something called the QRS axis. The QRS axis is basically the major axis that voltage is traveling through the ventricles. If we were to look at an actual EKG, or ECG trace. This is Q, this is R, and this is S. So we're looking at the direction that the voltage is going as it goes through this part of the, the ECG. And usually the QRS axis goes from the right atrium towards the left ventricle. It goes in that general direction. Now one of the things that we have to clarify though is we've talked about Eindhoven's triangle and we've talked about the augmented leads. And sometimes those leads are expressed radially. And we 
have to talk about that now because we want to understand when I say something's at zero degrees or something's at 180, what we're talking about. And this is in an additional video. We could start at zero, which is due east. 30, 60, 90, 120, and 150. We also go in the counterclockwise direction, only now we go, we call them negative numbers. So this is minus 30, minus 60, minus 90, minus 120, and minus 150. And so the QRS axis is usually given in terms of those numbers. And again, a normal QRS axis should be heading in this direction. Technically, normal can be anywhere from minus 30 to plus 120. So normally this arrow will be over here somewhere. When would it not be there? Well, let's just talk about a couple of examples. And let me just draw, because I want to talk about three examples. I want to talk about, first of all, what would it mean if the QRS axis went in this direction? One of the things we talked about when we were doing ECG is what this axis is, is actually the sum of multiple voltages. So the EKG is picking up the sum of all the voltage changes at once. What this would mean is there's more voltage heading in this direction than there is in this direction. Now that could be for two reasons. It could mean that there's hypertrophy on this side. Hypertrophy. There's more muscle on this side, which is creating more of a voltage change on this side, so it's pulling the axis in this direction. Or you could have an infarct on this side. So basically this axis is kind of like a tug of war between the left and the right side of the heart, and will shift towards the left side of the heart if there's either more muscle on this side or less muscle on this side. The way you'd get more muscle on this side would be hypertrophy. You could have something like mitral valve stenosis, where it's hard to pump blood through the mitral valve, and so this side of the heart develops a lot of excess muscle. And this is going to pull the QRS axis on this side. Or, I don't really know how to draw dead tissue, or this tug of war is offset by death on this side. So infarct on this side tissue is dying. The axis can shift in this direction for the same basic reasons, only we gotta reverse things. Maybe we have hypertrophy on this side, or we have an infarct. And so again, either we've added extra muscle on this side, or we've killed off muscle on this side. And so now, on balance, the tug of war favors the right side, so our QRS axis shifts in this direction. I did want to do one extreme, and this is called, let's do purple. This is called the northwest axis. And this is something you definitely don't ever want to see when you look over at your EKG trace, because that QRS axis again is a combination of voltage going this direction and this way. It's like a tug of war. The only way to get this axis here would be to remove this muscle completely. And then you'll notice that I've got an arrow pointing this direction. So essentially, if this all is non-functional because of a massive heart attack, then our QRS axis shifts to the northwest. Okay, so how, how do you figure out really, really quickly what it is? If you want a basic introduction, go to these people have put on a really kind of a nice animation, and it's called the frontal axis demo. You can actually rotate a circle around the heart and it'll change a 12 lead ECG as you rotate around. I want to just give you some simple rules and the first simple rule is find the isoelectric lead. An 
isoelectric means it's essentially there's the same amount of voltage above and below. The reason we want to find that lead is because that lead is having the most difficulty seeing the voltage change. Remember, really, really briefly, if we were looking at lead 2, and this is the heart, if the voltage is going with the lead, then it's going to be a big upward deflection. On the other hand, if the voltage is running perpendicular to our lead, then we see isoelectric. And so by finding the isoelectric lead, what we're doing is we're finding that the voltage is traveling perpendicular to that lead. So QRS axis is perpendicular to the isoelectric lead. Technically, we don't know which way. So let's look on this trace. I pulled this trace from Wikipedia. And it looks like AVL is our most isoelectric. There's about the same amount of voltage as there is above and below. Now, AVL is the minus 30 lead. So we know that our QRS axis is going to run perpendicular to this lead. Now we don't know which way it technically could go, and I'm just going to put this off to the side, it could be going in this direction, or it could be going in this direction, and that's a pretty big difference because this would be normal, and this would be major trouble. The next trick is pretty easy once you get it, which is to figure out are we going in this direction or this direction, is to find another lead nearby, look at the EKG, and look to see if it's positive or negative. So I'm just going to pick up lead 2 is right here. If we're positive in lead 2, then that must mean we're heading in this direction. You could have also done you could have also done AVF. AVF is right here. AV frontal, if we come down here and look, AV frontal is positive, therefore we must be headed in this direction. If our QRS axis was heading in this direction, we'd actually expect lead 2 to be negative. Or we'd expect our AVF lead to have a negative. So that's how you find QRS axis. Okay, so we're almost done. The next video in EKG, and what we're going to talk about now is pre cordial leads. Or oh, these are also called chest leads. Got this little picture from Wikipedia, so it's Creative Commons, and it shows you where those leads are. I should probably make this a little bit big. This is V1, V2, V3, V4, V. And usually there's just a V6. This figure has a V7, but there's usually just a V6. That's how we get to 12 leads. So when we're down here on the trace, we have lead 1, lead 2, lead 3 that we've already covered. We've got our augmented leads, which are AVR, AVL, and AVF. And then we have our six precordial leads. So V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. And so that's our 12 leads. In order to stand, understand precordial leads, we kind of have to visualize the heart in a transverse plane. So if we're looking straight down at the heart, it's a bit of an odd view, but it would look something like this. If you've ever cut open a sheep heart, or if you've ever been lucky enough to have a human specimen, you'll know that the left ventricle is much thicker than the right ventricle. And so we're cutting right through the ventricles. And again, this would be the left ventricle on this side, which has a much thicker heart wall. And this would be the right ventricle. And I'm going to leave it up to you, somewhat, to explore all, all of the voltage changes and how they'll look in the precordial leads. I'll give you a little head start, which is remember that atrial depolarization starts in the atria and moves in this direction. Or atrial depolarization moves in this direction. But by and large, the main axis, basically a uh, precordial lead is going to be kind of like QRS axis because 
we're going to go around in this direction. But what we really care about is the sum of that, kind of like we just cared about the sum of that with the QRS axis. We kind of care about the sum of the flow when we're looking at the precordial leads. We expect the current to flow, the voltage to flow from the right towards the left because the left has much more muscle. How do we pick up this flow? And let's orient these leads kind of like we had an Eindhoven's triangle. We got the same kind of thing now, only now our leads go in one direction. And these may not be precisely accurate because I'm doing it. The angles could be a little bit off. Let me just put it that way. I'm doing the best I can. It's V4. V5. V6. So hopefully already you can kind of get the idea that this is a good way to measure, kind of like we did with QRS, QRS axis, what direction things are flowing. Because we expect, if if voltage is flowing in the proper direction through the heart, to see a large positive in V6. Again, these leads work just the same as leads 1, 2, and 3. That if the voltage changes in the direction of the lead, it's, it goes up on the trace. If it's parallel to the lead, then that lead will see it the best. So V6 we would expect to have a normal, very large QRS complex. We would expect, since lead 3 is kind of perpendicular to, the, to our our flow, we'd expect V3 to be the smallest. And it's kind of isoelectric. So if there's any kind of changes, just like with QRS axis, if this were to shift in this direction, or if it were to shift in this direction, it would indicate that there's changes in the muscle. And it could be infarct, or it could be hypertrophy. I don't think I'm going to spend the time to do that in this, but I think based on your understanding of the QRS axis, you can kind of figure that out. But if this switches in this direction, it means there's a hypertrophy here, or it means there's an infarct on this side. And if it sh shifted in this direction, then we would expect a large negative in V3. So we'd expect the size of V3 to change, and we'd expect it to go negative. So I don't think I'm going to go into that into more detail. I'm a little concerned because this movie is getting a little long. And I think you can really figure it out by looking or thinking in terms of the QRS axis that this axis is going to shift based on muscle size or muscle thickness. And then you're going to see that shift by how the leads pick it up. Do they switch negative? Do they become more perpendicular? And so then the, the peak is smaller. In any case, you can kind of see the shift in the axis by noting the direction of the precordial leads and the size of the precordial leads. Thank you.